This meeting is being recorded. So welcome everybody um, to Pajapscott History Center's first program of the uh, year 2023. Uh, very excited to have you all here today for what I know is going to be a very stimulating program visually and um, in many other ways. Um, we really are grateful for um, all of our member and um, donor and friend support. And um, a lot of that um, comes from people who are engaged with our programs and participate. And we really are thankful for that. And it's great to be able to continue to do some programs on Zoom because that way we can have people join us who are not uh, local. So this program today is um, the kickoff to our theme this year. Uh, which is called Fine Slash Folk, Critiquing Our Artistic Past. And we wanted to have a big, uh, big umbrella theme this year so we could fit a lot under it, but we also wanted to ask some pointed and provocative questions about what we think about art, um, what are the so-called fine arts, why was, you know, why why and when did folk art become considered a legitimate kind of art? Um, who have the arts been available to over time and who have they not been available to? And how have people broken boundaries um, uh, in art? And so we're very lucky today to have Linda Dougherty, who is a, a associate professor um, of art history at Bowdoin Emerita. And um, she is going to do a talk on fine art, folk art, breaking the boundaries, which is a perfect title. And I know having seen the slides, I know you're going to be wowed by, by this, the content of this talk. Speaking of which, we do have a wonderful uh, list of all of the slides that she's going to be showing you today that I can email out after the fact that has um, the title of the, the, the painting or um, other piece of artwork and um, any references or citations that will allow you to find it uh, online if you want to look at it again. Um, so before I uh, introduce Linda formally and hand it over to her, I do also want to say we have um, outlined almost our full year of programming and which is really exciting to have done uh, so early in the year. Um, we still are working on confirming some things and venues and so forth, but we do have a number of programs listed on our website under the events page talks and presentations. We have another program coming up later this month um, and then programs in March and April that are are um, listed on there. So I encourage you to have a look at that and join us for some additional programs. Um, our annual meeting is also coming up in March on the 15th, and, and we're going to be awarding um, a special volunteer award at that, um, among other things, and that will be in person at the Curtis Memorial Library at 5 p.m. Um, on March 15th. Uh, so more to come about all of that. Um, Certainly, if you follow our e-news, if you're on there, you'll you'll get all of that information. Um, if you're not a member and um, you wish to become one, there's plenty of information on our website about that. Members help support all of our programming and um, also receive discounts on all programs and events. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Linda, but I do want to say a couple things first. Um, she is uh, she's a specialist in American art, largely um, pre mid century, um, but she's she's an incredible person who has um, broadly looked at American art, and um, she taught at Bowdoin for twenty seven years, and in the Bowdoin Orient, when she was retiring, um, her colleague Susan Wegner said that she's a really beloved teacher. All you have to do is look at her classes that start at 8.30 in the morning and they're filled with people because they wanna be taking class with her. And I think that you could almost say nothing better about a teacher um, that 
you know, I remember what morning classes in college were like. So you do have to be pretty engaged and excited to, to want to be there. Um, among Linda's many subjects of interest and scholarship and publication are Winslow Homer and Isabella Stewart Gardner, which I was just speaking with her about um, before the program. So both the woman who was an amazing person and the museum, of course, in Boston. And um, Linda taught an advanced seminar at Bowdoin called The World of Isabella Stewart Gardner, which I would uh, would be a dream course, I think, to take. Um, Linda's degrees are from, in order, Cornell, University of Chicago, and University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I will now hand it over to her. Thank you, Linda, and welcome. Well, thank you. It's been really nice to um, get to know Larissa. I'm embarrassed that we haven't gotten to know each other sooner. I, I told her when I came to Brunswick, the first place I went was to the Pajepscat Historical Society, as it was then called, and uh, met the director then. But I guess I've been um, just wallowing in retirement. But at any rate, I knew when she came to the center how happy everybody was to have her. And now I can certainly understand why. So it's Nice of you to come out, not at 8.30 in the morning. I have a couple of veterans of those 8.30 classes on the screen today. Um, but thank you for your time uh, this afternoon. So as Larissa said, what I'm going to do today is sort of set the stage for your year-long exploration of the visual arts and with particular attention to how art is defined. Oh, I think what I'm going to do before I do that is I'm going to put my screen on. How's that sound? Um, Oh, wait, just a minute. Here it is. Okay, good. We're, we're good? Oops. Okay, um, forgot about that. Perfect, and we can see it. So we're all good. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to focus on the historical distinction between fine art and folk art and how the boundaries between these two opposing categories have blurred and ultimately collapsed over time. So I'm going to start by laying out the traditional definitions of fine art and folk art and then consider how democratization, industrialization, modernism, nationalism, and multiculturalism subjected them to change. I will show how fine art provided models for creating and collecting folk art, while folk art broadened the scope of fine art and made it more inclusive. So to begin with the definitions, and these are very crude definitions, really um, largely relevant in the, in the 19th century. By the 20th century, things start to, to break apart. But just to get you started thinking about the contrast. So in terms of the artist, the fine artist is typically professionally trained, either in an academy or in a master's studio, whereas the folk artist is either self-taught or working out of a craft tradition of his or her community. Uh, the purpose of fine art is often intellectual or aesthetic, whereas folk art can serve a utilitarian purpose and also at the time serve to decorate one's environment. In terms of the form, fine art is traditionally characterized by illusionism, uh, and this illusion of three-dimensionality is achieved by techniques of modeling using light and shade and also pers perspectival tricks, whereas Folk art is usually has a flatter space that's achieved by strong line, color, and pattern. And finally, fine art is historically uh, the province of unique, of elite individuals, and also the institutions uh, that, they, that they found and patronize. Whereas folk art is really more for ordinary people and for the communities of, of which they're a part. So that's, those are just some categories to keep in your mind as we move forward and you will see how they start to dissolve. Uh, to just show you some examples, I'm gonna start with portraiture, which is the dominant art form in the colonial and early federal period. Uh, it served to document appearance and also to express status. Now the most sought after American portraitist in the late 18th and early 19th centuries was Gilbert Stuart. Born in Rhode Island, trained in the colonies and later in the British Royal Academy, Stuart painted the rich and famous in England, Ireland, and from Maine to Washington, DC. He was known for his ability to capture both the likeness and the soul of his sitters, making them appear to live and breathe on canvas. His portraits exemplify fine art. The subject of these two portraits, these companion portraits, is the second president, John Adams, and his wife, Abigail. 
Stewart earned fame and money with portraits of the first five presidents of the United States, which he used as a basis for painted copies and reproductive prints. John and Abigail appear here before a plain background, engaging the viewer directly with their gaze. A contrasting example of folk art are these companion portraits of an unknown man and woman by the self-taught artist Rufus Porter. Porter was born in Massachusetts, raised and educated in Maine. And there was a recent exhibition of his work at the uh, Bowdoin College Museum of Art, which many of you may have seen. Porter was an itinerant artist who worked initially in small towns and villages along the mid-Atlantic seaboard. When he returned to New England, he began doing murals for inns and houses, often painting portraits of their owners. We know nothing, however, about the identity of these sitters or the circumstances of the portraits making. Juxtaposing Stewart's Abigail Adams to portrait Porter's unknown woman illustrates the formal difference outlined above between fine and folk art. Both works accurately depict the individual appearance of the sitters. Both show them in fine costume with decorative ornament, but here the similarities end. Stewart paints in the venerable medium of oil on canvas. Porter works in watercolor on paper. Stewart's portrait is life-size, made to be publicly displayed. Porter's is three by four inches, suited for more intimate viewing. Abigail Adams, seated three-quarter view in a chair, appears three-dimensional, the unknown woman against the plain white background, flat. Stewart uses chiaroscuro modeling, that is light and shade, while Porter emphasizes outline. Hence, Abigail Adams appears more lifelike, Porter's unknown woman frozen in time. While folk artists did less to animate their sitters visually, their portraits tell us a lot about the context in which these people lived. The very commissioning of a portrait indicates an aspiration for social status and lifestyle typically reserved for the elite. By the 1830s, a rising middle class outside the urban centers of New England fueled a demand for consumer goods to ornament their homes. Portraits were among these objects as well as the decorative art. So this is a democratization of access to art. Erastus Salisbury Field, another itinerant folk painter, captures this phenomenon in his elaborate group portrait of the family of Joseph Moore. As in Porter's watercolors, the sitters are individually described with strong outlines and minimal internal modeling. They wear fine clothes and sit in a spacious domestic interior embellished with painted chairs, polished furniture, and a brightly patterned floor covering tilted upward at the back. It looks like they're going to slide off the rug. Uh, the shaded windows and blank mirror further flatten the picture space, making this image less about an illusion than about the social ambition of the sitters. Folk portraits also serve as documents of who comprised 19th century American society. <clears throat> While African Americans are stereotypically linked with slavery, Backborn William Merritt Pryor's companion portraits of William and Nancy Lawson attest to middle-class Black achievement in the antebellum era. Lawson was not a minister, as this old uh, slide indicates, but a clothing merchant in Boston, and this may explain something of the elaborateness of his wife's dress. Like the Moore family, he and Nancy wear fine clothes and decorative jewelry. She has a brooch and a ring. He has a watch fob. William Lawson smokes a cigar while Nancy Lawson holds a book, symbolic of education and for a female sitter, virtue. While portrait painting proliferated in early America, folk artists also ventured into other genres to satisfy an audience and or fulfill their own ambitions. In the 1920s, lands, excuse me, 1820s, landscape painting came to prominence as a means of representing national identity. Thomas Cole's Niagara Falls on the left depicts America's most celebrated and natural wonder in the early 19th century. Cole, an English immigrant, became the founder of the Hudson River School of Landscape Painting. This group of artists working from observation defined the new world nature in terms of wildness. Though Cole was technically self-taught, his compositions reflect close study of fine art in printed reproduction. In his published writings, Cole likened the American wilderness to the Garden of Eden. And this biblical association also informs the work of Quaker minister and folk artist Edward Hicks, whom you see on the right. Hicks, however, 
paints Niagara from a physically impossible viewpoint with American and Canadian falls side by side. The poem by Hicks that surrounds the picture further holds the composition on the surface. So while Cole creates an illusion of Niagara's sublimity, you feel like you're really there, Hicks captures it in words. And every time I tried to read this poem, I get dizzy going around the edge. But you can see at the very bottom, he says that the experience of Niagara bids us kneel and time's great God adore. In the hierarchy of fine art, history painting was assigned the highest place because it called for imagination as well as observation. A stunning example by German-born Emanuel Leutze, Washington crossing the Delaware, recreates the Continental Army's perilous crossing of the frozen winter river, excuse me, on Christmas Eve, 1776. And this was the first step in the surprise attack on Hessian mercenaries at Trenton. This scene shows all members of American society, no pun intended, in, in the same boat. So we have a Scotsman, an African-American in the, in the foreground. We have a woodsman with the coonskin cap and some farmers in the rear. Though conceived and painted in Germany as an inspiration to liberal reformers, Leutze's revolutionary subject quickly gained popularity in a nation fracturing over the issue of slavery. Leutze himself made copies, as did an unknown artist who translated it into the language of folk art. In this much smaller variation, possibly based on an engraving, strong lines and bright colors set up a rhythmic pattern across the picture plane. The individual figures are closely replicated, but their anatomical solidity has disappeared. The jagged ice flows and the flag too have lost their three dimensionality, becoming essentially flat strokes of paint. The effort expended on this reproduction attests to the importance of the subject and the aspiration of the unknown painter. And one difference I would call to your attention, which always fascinates me is the way that the black man in the front of the Lois's painting has become a white man in the in the folk art. And I don't know if this was intentional or if it was just a negligence or what the reason was. So this is um, uh, a question that remains unanswered. Folk artists who worked in portrait landscape and history are are sometimes called naive painters, a reference to their lack of formal training. Folk art also, however, includes objects made to serve a utilitarian, utilitarian purpose while decorating the home. The quilting party um, here shows how women's work figures prominently in the category of folk art. A group is gathered around a quilting table and you see the communal character of the artistic enterprise. The grandmother in the foreground concentrates on her needlework. Mothers watch their children, and younger women enjoy the attention from young men. Strong line, bright color, flat form, and the pattern of the quilt make this a quintessential piece of folk art. And to the right, the window shades are also ornamented with rural scenes. A surviving example of such window shade painting is the Mahantango Valley Farm, which has the formal aesthetic of a quilt. The high horizon line makes the image appear two-dimensional, split rail fences, divide buildings, pastures, fields, and orchards into separate sections. The American flag flying to the right adds a patriotic note, and the oversized bill, bowl in the foreground below it shows what was really important to this farmer. And I love this gigantic bowl. Uh, quilting designs were often purely geometric and abstract. These two pieced examples in starburst and log cabin patterns are intricately detailed with striking optical effects. Applique quilts, in which pieces of fabric are sewn onto a backing, are more pictorial. They represent personal interests and experience and the historical moment in which they were made. In this elaborate example, soldiers, sailors, and American flags make reference to the Civil War and the sympathies of the quilt's creator. In the third row down, second scene from the from the left, a large black man tells a smaller white man on horseback, Master, I am free. While African Americans appear in 19th century quilts, little documented work survives from black hands. Enslaved women who sewed for their owners made their own heavily used quilts from whatever scraps they could obtain. 
A rare exception from the late 19th century are two pictorial quilts made by Harriet Powers, a Georgia woman born into slavery, whom you've seen on the left. Powers was, quote, discovered by an artist and art teacher when she exhibited her work at the 1886 Cotton Fair in Atlanta. In, the, in Atlanta, these local exhibitions were oftentimes very important for bringing folk art to broader attention. The pictorial quilt shown here was given to the Reverend Charles Cuthbert Hall, president of Union Seminary, by a group of faculty ladies from Atlanta University. This institution was founded in 1865 by the American Missionary Association to educate African Americans. In the 15 panels, Powers represents biblical subjects and unusual natural phenomena. On the top row, we see Adam and Eve with the serpent, the fourth from the left. And in the, the second row below it, um, we see the, a scene called The Falling of the Stars from 1833. And that's third from the left. And this was a scene that was uh, took place before Powers was born, but which was survived in legend. So in both cases, she's imagining these subjects. The cut pieces appear to float in space without the strong ground line seen in the previous example by Lucinda Ward. And just to remind you how many of her uh, panels have the strong green ground line. Um, in concept and technique, Powers Arch has been compared to West African textile traditions of the Kingdom of Dahomey. But the appreciation of her handwork also reflects ambivalence towards machine-made goods. Admiration for folk art in the late 19th century coincided with increasing industrialization. Mass production made utilitarian objects more affordable, but to deprive them of creative individuality. Concurrently in fine art, painters began to challenge the hegemony of illusionism, which they equated with the materialism of the age. In so doing, they used a language akin to folk art to represent more than the eye could see. Though creating worlds apart, French symbolist Paul Gauguin's Yellow Christ and Harriet Power's pictorial quilt share similarities in style and purpose. Fine and folk artists similarly deploy simplified forms, strong outlines, and flat space to infuse a biblical subject with spiritual content. The color of Gauguin's Yellow Christ symbolizes rather than describes the intensity of Christ's passion. While power celestial imagery of the sun going into darkness ties an earthly narrative to a heavenly realm. In the early 20th century, modernism evolved rapidly with one breakthrough following another. Henri Matisse's folkism made highly saturated color expressive rather than descriptive. And so on the left, you see how he uses this, these intense colors and uh, connecting lines to give a sense of the energy of the dance rather than to show figures in some sort of three-dimensional space. Pablo Picasso's cubism on the right explored the temporal character of vision by breaking three-dimensional forms apart and recomposing them in two dimensions. And note his use of newspaper in this work um, and the importance of words often in, in folk art. This, this will recur, we've seen it in Hicks and we'll see it again. Young American artists embraced the innovations of European modernism, which they discovered while traveling abroad and at the 1913 Armory Show in New York. A quintessential example is Max Weber's Chinese restaurant, which unites Fova's color and Cubist form. While redefining what fine art looked like, modernism made viewers see folk art differently. Though made for different purposes, Weber's Chinese restaurant and a 19th century crazy quilt exhibit fragmented form, intense color, and dynamic rhythm on a flat surface. Ironically, a growing taste for modernism in art served to increase appreciation for tradition. Changing tastes also coincided with the rise of American nationalism in the aftermath of World War II. While much of Europe struggled to recover, the United States emerged strong in position to assume international leadership, though not fully accepting of this at this point. National pride generated interest in cultural history. 
objects previously regarded as unschooled or merely utilitarian became sought after as evidence of American distinction. And some were even inclined to suggest that American folk art had anticipated uh, European modernism. That was probably a bit of a stretch, but it shows the um, nationalism of the period. Enlightened collectors took the lead in the acquisition, exhibition, and donation of American folk art, bringing it to institutions hitherto reserved for fine art. First and foremost was Abby Aldrich Rockefeller, daughter of Rhode Island Senator Nelson Aldrich and wife of Standard Oil heir John D. Rockefeller Jr. Abby Rockefeller's taste in art was progressive and wide ranging. In 1925, she began collecting contemporary American art and European modernism. With fellow collectors Lily P. Bliss and Mary Quinn Sullivan, she conceived and co-founded the Museum of Modern Art, to which she donated many works in her collection. The year MoMA opened, 1929, Rockefeller also began purchasing American folk art. Some of these acquisitions were given to MoMA, which organized a traveling exhibition titled The Art of the Common Man in 1934. Abby Rockefeller's interest in folk art complimented one of her husband's pet projects, the restoration of colonial Williamsburg. After her death, he built and endowed the new Abby Aldrich Rockefeller Museum of Folk Art in Williamsburg to house his wife's collection. So the Rockefellers give us two very um, important and progressive institutions, MoMA and um, the Abby Aldrich Museum in Williamsburg. Other admirers of American folk art donated their collection to existing institutions. Maxime and Martha Karolik, made acquisitions in collaboration with the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and you've already seen uh, the Moore family and the Powers pictorial quilt. In 1939, they gave 300 pieces to the museum. Edgar and Bernice Garbish began buying American folk art in the 1940s. By the 1960s, they had acquired 2,600 paintings. Most were bequeathed to museums around the country, with the largest number going to the National Gallery of Art in Washington. Paintings owned by the Carolics and Garbages exemplify the conceptual versus perceptual character of 19th century American folk art. The diminutive silhouette and the dual perspective in Meditation by the Sea heightens the appearance of nature's vastness. So if you look at the picture, you can see on the left, we're rushing straight back into space according to one point perspective. But then when you look at the right, we're in fact looking out at an angle. So there's really two perspectives going on here. The cat similarly distorts proportion to show nature from the feline's point of view. In both paintings, the idea is more important than the illusion. And by the 20th century, that had also become a characteristic of fine art. Collecting of American folk art between the wars extended beyond painting to the useful arts and beyond wealthy philanthropists to ordinary people. Decorative arts were admired for both their traditional handcraft and a simplicity in keeping with modern machine production. And so by the 20s and 30s, the machine was not seen as uh, a threat to, to art, but rather as the source of a new modern aesthetic. Charles Sheeler's American Interior exemplifies the intersection of modernism, tradition, and nationalism while showcasing his personal collection of decorative arts. The high horizon line flattens the composition spatially, accentuating the patterns on bedspread rugs and pottery. A shaker box shows the fine artist's admiration for the streamlined aesthetic of this 19th century religious group. Modernist painters also found inspiration in the craft traditions of other cultures. Lewiston-born Marsden Hartley's Indian fantasy presents a composite view of Native American life. Beneath a mythical thunderbird, we see canoes, teepees, feathered headdresses, and some pottery there down at the bottom. Uh, objects that are associated with different tribes and different regions of the country. Having waged war on Native American life in the 19th century, Americans developed an avid appreciation for their art in the 20th century. This began with the advent of tourism, when handcrafts were bought as souvenirs of travel. Soon, however, discerning collectors saw the aesthetic quality in objects made for practical use. Traditions pre preserved, passed on, and reinvigorated by women in particular gained status as fine art. Pottery by Pueblo peoples of the Southwest came to the attention of Anglo-Americans with the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. These pots are made not with wheels or molds, but with coils of local clay 
laid on top of one another, pressed into shape and burnished by hand. They are fired not in kilns, but in earthen pits with wood, dung, or coal as fuel. The first Southwestern potter to gain celebrity was Nampeo of Hano from Northern Arizona's Hopi Mesa, who sold her wares at the Grand Canyon Lodge, among other places. Nampeo was known for working with extraordinary speed. The large bowl on the right, painted with a Hopi migration design, shows her remarkable ability to create broad, flat shapes that did not cave in at the center. And I should say also that in addition to the tourists, the Transcontinental Railroad brought, brought anthropologists and ethnographers who were also interested in these Native American traditions, and many of whom um, became sort of middlemen for, for Anglo collecting. The most famous Southwestern potter was Maria Martinez of San Ildefonso Pueblo in New Mexico. And she's from the Tiwa tribe. With her husband, Julian, who did the painting, she developed a signature black on blackware whose elegant sheen and simplified designs appeared to a modern taste for streamlined form. Abby Aldridge and John G. Rockefeller admired and collected Maria's work and in 1930 asked her to lay the cornerstone for Rockefeller Center, so she became a celebrity in her time. Here in Maine, Wabanaki basketry similarly evolved from useful craft to fine art from the late 19th to the 20th centuries. Faced with the European incursion on their way of life, basket makers initially kept their culture and themselves alive by adapting traditional forms for sales to tourists. Though the market declined at mid-century, women like Molly Neptune Parker of the Passamaquoddy tribe continued to weave baskets out of brown ash and sweetgrass, local materials, and to pass her knowledge on to younger generations. Parker is best known for her fancy baskets in which utilitarian forms are given an ornamental twist. So on the sewing basket, you see the floral uh, motif on the top and of course the, the colored bands that um, animate the sweet grass and the, and the ash strips. She also invented, and you can see the interior of that basket that she's holding on the, on the right. She also invented signature basket shapes, such as the acorn basket and the strawberry basket shown below. By the time of her death in 2020, her creations were selling for thousands of dollars. And when she initially made baskets, she was trading them for dental care for her children. So she, her reputation certainly grew. As a founder and president of the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance, a nonprofit organization that offers workshops, apprenticeships, and sales, Molly Neptune Parker assured that her people's traditional art form would be preserved. In 2012, she was named a National Heritage Fellow by the National Endowment for the Arts, and that's an honor given to only nine individuals in, in a given year. While traditional Native American... Oops. Going on here. While traditional Native American crafts were expanding the fine art canon, African-American painters gained attention and respect for works resembling folk art. Through contacts and channels previously monopolized by white artists, they came to the attention of and earned admiration from a larger audience. One of the first to gain widespread recognition was Horace Pippin, a self-taught artist from Pennsylvania who painted portraits, landscapes, and biblical and historical subjects. Pippin served in World War I with an infantry unit known as the Harlem Hellfighters. He was shot in the right shoulder by a German sniper and never regained full mobility. He took up painting in the 1920s as a way of, to rehabilitate his injured arm. Pippin was discovered, quote, in the late 1930s by art critic Christian Brinton and artist N.C. Wyeth when he sent two paintings to a local Chester County art show. Taken with the work, Britain gave Pippin a solo exhibition and introduced him to MoMA curators Dorothy Miller and Holger Cahill, art dealers Robert Carlin and Edith Halpert, and art collector Albert Barnes. And Pippin in the 1940s took art appreciation classes at the Barnes Foundation. And Barnes also collected his art. During the remaining eight years of his life, he exhibited widely and sold work to private collectors and museums. Christmas morning harks back to Pippin's childhood. The domestic interior is neat, tidy, and sparsely furnished. Pattern rugs and tree ornaments embellish the otherwise austere scene. 
As in the quilting party, decorative arts provide a focal point of color and pattern and serve to flatten the perspective. But while the 19th century painting brims with communal activity, Pippin's image captures the quiet intimacy between a single black mother and her son. As a history painter, Pippin broadened the venerable category of fine art to include African-American experience. John Brown going to his hanging shows the abolitionist leader who had attempted to foment a slave rebellion at Harbor's Ferry, riding in a wagon bound with ropes. While a crowd of white spectators watches, a lone black woman in the right foreground turns away. She faces the audience with a mournful expression as hope for a better future passes by. Black women move to center stage in Faith Ringgold's multimedia creations whose similarity to folk art reflects artistic choice. Raised in New York during the Harlem Renaissance, Ringel studied art at CUNY, but ultimately turned away from oil paintings associations with Western European tradition and masculinity. As a child, Ringel was inspired by Pippin's John Brown going to his hanging, which she encountered in a textbook. She was disturbed, however, by the fact that it was the only image by an African-American artist. In the 1980s, Ringel began creating fabric-based story quilts, drawing inspiration from her mother, a fashion designer, and her father, a storyteller. Her first, Who's Afraid of Aunt Jemima, takes a stereotypical figure from blackface minstrelsy and product advertising and gives her a new feminist identity. Ringgold's Aunt Jemima is a business owner, independent thinker, and family matriarch, and is based on Ringgold's aunt's working with a painted center and a quilted fabric border, she uses words and images to tell the story of a strong Black woman. And Ringel always said she couldn't get her autobiography published, so she created these uh, story quilts to, as a different way of telling Black women's stories. In the Sunflower Quilting Bee at Arles from the French collection, Ringel pays tribute to notable historical figures and to women's work in folk art. Gathered around a quilting table in a field of sunflowers, going left to right, Madam C.J. Walker, Sojourner Truth, Ida B. Wells, Fanny Lou Hamer, Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, Mary McLeod Bethune, and Ella Baker appear, like Ringle herself, as artists and as activists. In the texts, top and bottom, the women explain that when the quilt is finished, they can move on to the real art of working for a better for a better world. In recent decades, quilts by African American women have attained the status of fine art. Most notable are those made in G's Bend, Alabama, an isolated rural community southwest of Selma, many of whose residents trace their ancestry to slavery on the Petway Plantation at G's Bend. G's Bend quilts came to national attention when collector William Arnett organized a traveling exhibition in 2002. New York Times art critic Michael Kimmelman, Kimmelman praised them not as folk art, but quote, as some of the most miraculous works of modern art America has produced. In 2003, the G's Bend Quilting Collective was founded to oversee production and sales. Uh, G's Bend quilters, Mary Lee Bendoff, Lucy Mingo, whose Pinebrook quilt you see on the left, and Loretta Petway were joint recipients of a National Heritage Fellowship in 2015, and that was an honor that also had gone to Molly Neptune Parker. The women of G's Bend build on Af an African-American tradition of making textiles for home and family, from recycled clothes, feed sacks, and fabric remnants. In contrast to the ordered, regular compositions of Euro-American quilts, their designs have a dynamic, syncopated, improvisational quality. No two are identical. Like Pueblo potters and Wabanaki basket makers, G's Bend quilters bring innovation to the creative process while instructing younger generations in traditional styles and standards. In their unique creations, the line between fine and folk art has been definitively erased. So the last piece I want to show you can be seen not in a gallery or a museum, but rather on occasion in a public setting and always virtually. The Names Project AIDS Memorial Quilt was conceived in 1985 to commemorate individuals who had died in the early years of the pandemic. At that time, the stigma associated with AIDS left many survivors with no place to bury their loved ones' remains or to give them a funeral. 
The project provided an opportunity to celebrate lives lost and to mourn collectively. As a traditional source of comfort, they could be infinitely expanded. The quilt form format was symbolically as well as practically appropriate. The AIDS Memorial quilt consists of fabric panels three by six feet in size, backed with canvas and sewn together in blocks of eight. They are created by individuals or groups using a vast array of fabrics, decorative materials, and personal items. Panels may honor family members, personal friends, or public figures with whom the maker feels a connection. Designs range from simple to complex, representational to abstract, monochrome to brightly colored, as you can see. The purpose of the AIDS quilt is to increase awareness, offer support in healing, and raise money for prevention and education. It brings the voices of another previously marginalized group to the fore. As of 2020, it consisted of 48,000 panels honoring 94,000 people, and it weighed 54 tons. The original work is housed in San Francisco and maintained, repaired, and managed by a group called the Handmaidens of the Quilt. Joining a utilitarian craft tradition with contemporary fine art activism, the AIDS Memorial Quilt is the largest piece of community folk art in the world. So in conclusion, I hope I have shown you how the definition of art is constantly in flux. It changes and grows through creative production, the infrastructure of patrons, collectors, critics, and institutions that surrounds it, and the historical context in which it is made and viewed. We are wont to judge what art is according to preconceived expectations, but we should also bring to the question an open mind. By so doing, we can expand our cultural horizons and appreciate the full richness and diversity of human creativity. So I've got here um, a list of places, some close, some not so close, uh, where you could see Amer American folk art. Um, and I also want to call your attention to the fact that there is a newly opened exhibition at the Portland Museum of Art uh, called American Spe Perspectives that showcases work from the American Folk Art and Museum in New York. So that's a wonderful opportunity for you to go down and spend some time uh, with some of these, these wonderful works. Um, so I know Larissa has things to show you, and then I'd be happy to take questions um, after that. And thank you again for coming and for giving me a chance to talk about such a wonderful topic. Thank you. I'm going to sign out now and put Larissa on. I Linda, that was fantastic. Um, it, it's amazing to me that um, we've we've just had sort of this wild survey from John Adams to the AIDS quilt. <laughs> um, it's it's pretty incredible. Well, we well, said it would be a wild ride, you know. So. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of amazing things in between. So what I'm going to do very quickly is just show you a few things from the PHC collection that link up with some of the things that um, Linda talked about today um, so that you can see what we have here, a few of the things that we have in our collection that are relevant to our local history um, that kind of touch on um, points in this amazing survey of, of the history of, of fine and folk art. Um, so I will very quickly share my screen here. And um, hopefully you are all seeing that. I'm going to get rid of, there we go. Um, and bear with me for a second so I can get to the actual thing that I need here. Start the slideshow. So um, I wanted to just pull up some portraiture from our collection um, because we have a lot of examples of sort of, you know, classic sort of old New England portraiture and um, and and certainly a lot of old white men in the in those portraits. Um, but this is a um, oil paintings of Dr. Jonathan Page and his wife. And um, sadly, I don't have his wife's name in front of me, Mary. Um, and um, and uh, John Brewster Jr. is the artist here. And he was a fairly important um, artist uh, 
and in the mid 19th century and, and early to mid 19th century, um, born in 1766, deaf itinerant painter. And so these are probably two of the more um, quote unquote valuable paintings in our collection because of the artists specifically. <clears throat> And then I thought I would contrast it with a very different um, por portrait in the collection, which um, is, um, actually I don't have the date on it here, but a uh, pastel of Dr. Charles Lincoln. Um, and I believe this actually is also 19th century and just a very, you know, obviously different, um, different type of art and um, more modern looking in some ways. And we do have probably, boy, I don't, I don't know how many portraits specifically, but a couple hundred anyway of varying kinds. Um, so this is just a tiny, tiny little sample. I wanted to also um, show you something that is clearly more in the folk art realm. This is actually a snuff box, and we do have pictures of it open, which I didn't include here. It's a wooden, black wooden box um, and uh, black inside as well with this um, painting on the front. Um, and we don't have a lot of information. Uh, the donor, Mrs. A.E. Chase, this was given to us. Um, very early on, it's one of our older items in the collection. So we were given it in the early 20th century. Um, and we don't have a whole lot of, of painted folk art items, craft items, or, or utilitarian items like this, but there are a few, few interesting things in the collection kicking around. I also thought I would include our fire buckets. We have a large collection of fire buckets. These are just a few of them. Um, and they're actually on display in the museum shop. They have been for a while. And it's this is so interesting to me because they all have these wonderful designs and company names on them. Um, and we do have some that literally just have the name, but these are some with more decorative uh, features on them. Clearly an entirely utilitarian item, but one that uh, people obviously felt some pride um, in ownership um, of them. And those are obviously leather. They're really amazing, amazing pieces. I wanted to show you a couple of quilts. We have quite a number in the collection. We'll actually be dealing more with quilts in April. We're gonna be doing an amazing panel of textile artists. Um, actually five or six people. And it looks like we'll be hosting that um, at the, the gal in the gallery room, uh, which is now Nomad Pizza, uh, which used to be Frontier. We're gonna have that up there and that should be quite an event. Um, Lori Labar, who is a uh, curator at the Maine State Museum will be one of the panelists and we'll be talking specifically about quilts. But I wanted to show you today a couple in our collection, one of which is the more uh, very sort of symmetrical, um, geometric um, uh, friendship quilt that was given to Reverend John Collins um, in 1861 um, as a Thanksgiving present. He was a minister at Oars Island and um, the makers of the quilt wrote, um, you can't really, you can't see it from this picture, but wrote um, their names and good wishes and messages on the quilt for him. And that would be contrasted with this beautiful crazy quilt. We have several uh, crazy quilts in the collection. And we also have Fanny Chamberlain's crazy quilt pieces that she never put together because she went blind um, as she was trying to make that. Uh, this crazy quilt was made actually by um, Lida Schofield. Um, so a member of the Schofield family, not the ones that lived at their Schofield Whittier house here, but um, it was made by her on a ship while going around the world, while the ship was all over the place. And this is what she did to pass the time on her father's clipper ship. And this was made about 1880 and donated to us in 1991. 
And then I wanted to show you um, a couple of examples of stoneware pottery that we have in the collection. These are Wabanaki, and these um, were dug up uh, in 1891 on Potts Point in Harpswell. Um, you can see there they have markings on them, both, both pieces. We actually have a whole box of pieces. Um, and um, we don't have they we don't have a date on them specifically, uh, but they are pretty fascinating to have in the collection. And then, um, as Linda was mentioning, a lot of um, these sort of um, indigenous uh, and other um, cultural groups, there were tourism tourist items that were created that were collected by all sorts of folks, including. The Schofield Whittier family here um, at uh, the our house here that we own, the Jeff Scott, um, has in that house all kinds of um, collectibles, so to speak, from around the world that they picked up. And these two pots are from the Southwest. We don't know a whole lot about them. Um, they're quite small. They're probably four inches high or so. Uh, and they um, are sitting on a uh, kind of a knickknack shelf in the back hallway upstairs. Um, clearly not locally made, um, but, um, and, you know, with interesting patterns um, and from, for sure, from the 19th century, um, at least. So those are just a few things I wanted to share from our collection so that you had some connections to Linda's amazing presentation with regard to what we have here. Uh, and finally, I guess I would end with um, this great artwork that we have had sent out with our last newsletter, which is by Rita Langlois, who was a um, disabled woman here in Brunswick who drew this or painted this wonderfully um, colorful and fun image of skaters and uh, Governor John McKernan back in the 80s, I guess, um, used this as one of the state's Christmas cards, which is kind of a fun fact. So I will stop sharing that and I would be more than happy to, um, Linda would be more than happy to take um, a couple few questions if folks would like to unmute and ask one or write something in the chat box. Or okay. even a comment. Oh, and Linda's got a question. <laughs> oh, can you hear me? I'm, yes. I'm, I'm terrible on tech. You know, those that Brewster was a deaf artist yes. in Maine. He's so interesting. And there was a show of his work in Portland a number of years ago, big show. But um, those are really treasures, and I love the red, the little red book. You know, it's amazing how much you know about those individual works of decorative art. I mean, it's really quite incredible. Uh, you know, that's that history is hard to preserve. It is. It is. Yeah. I mean, we always want to know more, but we're lucky with yeah, what we. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot. we do know. Yeah. So. I said, uh, did I see a hand? Somewhere? Yes, you did. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. This question was for Linda. Yeah. I was fascinated in the picture honoring uh, the heroines of Black history with the, yeah. all the sunflowers. It right. looked like there was Van Gogh in the back. Well, he, he is in the back. Okay, and that and in the, the text, um, the the women regard him as kind of a nuisance, you know. And Harriet Tubman says, you know, oh, get him away. He reminds me of slavers and, and so forth. So, but um, other people ha have written about it. And this is kind of something that I see in it too. It's almost as though he's presenting this face of sunflowers as a kind of donation or offering to these uh, black women quilters. And I, I read another woman and sort of saw it the, sa the same way. So sort of paying homage to them with his own art, but also indicating that they're going beyond his art. So I think you can take it, uh, you know, diff different different ways. But she did a whole series. She It's 12 panels of this French collection. Um, and it's a, it's a series, um, there's a story as always with Ringgold's 
work like this. And she has this young woman, it's kind of an alter ego. Um, her name is uh, Willa Marie Simone. And she goes uh, to Europe uh, and becomes involved in the art scene as, as sort of an, a, a model and an artist herself. But she meets everybody, you know, and then there's no, there's great conflation of time there. So Oftentimes, the text around these different panels are talking to, to her, you know, to, they're talking about her adventure, or people are talking to her. So the in, in the case of the sunflowers, the women are explaining to her what they're doing and that their aspiration to go ultimately on to the real art of changing the world and so forth. Um, but she also, in that group, she does um, panels that sort of riff on, uh, you know, famous works uh, of earlier painting, like she'll show Willa, the the, the young woman, as uh, a model for, you know, uh, Matisse. Uh, so so she, it's, it's very creative. I mean, she's, she's always telling a story. So I think you're absolutely sharp to talk about the sunflowers. And I think it's kind of, you know, we can sort of make out of it what we want to make of it. Yeah, because my cake was entirely different. I thought maybe they were honoring him as being the inspiration oh, for the will. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's interesting. I I that's very interesting. I don't know. I mean, in the text, I think it says something like after the women, you know, finish their quilt and, and leave, uh he kind of just fades into the field of sunflowers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> kind of looks like a sunflower himself. Um, but Clearly, I mean, and you know, with with so much of this art, there's this dialogue going on, you know, with 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 the past, and this is oftentimes this um uh, sort of talking back at it or inverting it, but at the same time honoring it, you know. So I think I think it's 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 fun to think about. All right, thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Another well, question out there? Don't be shy. Well, let me see if I can think to ask you a question. Um, so did when when you think about folk art, was it pretty much what I was telling you? I mean, when when you know what I was showing you, is that what your ideas were of folk art? Um, or so you, sort of the distinction? I think today it's hard not to get more enthused about folk art than so-called fine art, although fine art has taken on so many of the features of folk art, both, you know, formally and conceptually. Yeah. Uh -huh. Hi, um, I possess uh, three paintings that my grandmother did probably in the 1950s. Uh -huh. um, they would, I think would fall in They're They're more two dimensional. Uh -huh. uh, it, it, they're woodland scenes with the deer, uh -huh. uh, you uh -huh. know, getting water out of the river and stuff on birch trees and things like that. But would they be considered folk art, even though she's not famous and she oh, <laughs> nobody's you don't ever have heard to be of famous her? To make art, <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, I mean. As I say, I think in many ways the categories have kind of dissolved in the present day, you know, and it's all kind of uh, just art. But if people were, I mean, I can't see them, but from what you describe, I mean, people would look at them and see them as part of a of a of a tradition. I've lost you. Where did my question person go? No, I'm um, here. Oh, um, here. No, she she <laughs> yes. uh, she also uh, braided rugs. She was very famous because oh, yeah. she, she became blind, and oh. she could tell the by the fabric what she was working with. So she would braid, I, I I have three of her rugs. I have a huge one that was in her living room for 50 years, then my mother had it in her living room for 20 years. That's amazing. And then she gave it to me, but she would have somebody else have to uh, stitch, you know, the, 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 the long things together. Right. But she would actually make the, the braided rugs. And she, she was named Miss, Mrs. Maine one year. Um, oh, back in the fifties, wow. uh, she had ten children and adopted an eleventh. <laughs> wow! wow. Yeah, I would say, hang on tight to those things. Those oh, are, I do. I, just, I treasure them. treasures. You know, <laughs> yeah. and I, I do think you know. I mean, women's work has was for so long just you know disregarded or seen as kind of of second. I rate. think I think she did most of it after her children left home. Well, after she, had <laughs> you know, she was them. she was a school teacher. She was a school teacher when they were when they were young. But uh, well, um, I think she, as far like as children. I know, she did most of it after after they 
left home, but I, I was just curious as to whether it would be considered folk art, even though nobody ever heard well, of it. Well, I think her. they would probably say, well, I mean, in, in principle, yes, because I mean, she's probably self-taught. You oh, know, yes. if you go back to the old definition, yep. um, she's making at least the rugs, you know, for some sort of utilitarian, <laughs> you know, purpose. And you say the painting has some of those formal qualities. So I think, yeah, in many ways, she 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 fits the definition. It's just, you know, that our contemporary view of folk art is, has, has changed. My original I mean, question was about Van Gogh. <laughs> oh, well, did you, you know, have a comment first. about Van Gogh? Did you well, no, add? I just I, I just happened to notice him and. Uh, right towards the end and I, my impression initially was just that he was paying homage to the women uh -huh. Uh -huh. but that I was just curious what your take on it was so yeah well I I think he should pay homage to those women I yes, think it yeah. would be a very good thing for him for him for him, for him to do you know um thank you yeah no those are those are wonderful observations and wonderful objects that you have my goodness I always wanted to make beautiful things. I have absolutely no talent. I mean, I just have no talent, but I love beautiful things. So I, I'm always impressed by people who can make them. Well, um, you're on the, the you're, you do have tons of talent, clearly. <laughs> you're, you're the one who shares your education. Well, of all I of share this my, because, well, can you tell people you're an art historian? Of course, nowadays they think you're crazy. They used to think <laughs> Eight. but 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 they all think they think you're an artist you know you know they all want to know what you make you know yeah <laughs> um I saw that Kathy Kathy had a question and so I think we'll take just, that and then we'll we'll wrap up Kathy um, just a quick question about are you are you familiar with uh the curtains that are made particularly in granges that hung behind the stage oh, and no. uh you are well there, there are some incredible examples. I think even the Thompson Grange uh -huh. may have them, and a lot of them uh, are advertisements for local businesses. But uh -huh. there's a lot of what seems to me to qualify as folk art in uh -huh. those um, those curtains. I just, I just wondered if you were familiar yeah. with them. No, I've, They're I've be never beautiful. Seen they sound beautiful i've never seen them so are they applique is that how they're no no they're they're painted on they're canvas painted. oh okay. and uh you oh, know wow. lots of i'm sure other places are other than granges but in maine yeah. that was uh you know a real local organization oh, okay. and uh there are some really amazing ones out there just yeah. I think, thought i'd mention them no, and, I, I, I think they um I think St. John's has one. I said I think St. John's has one because oh, I've seen photos yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, and but that's a whole that I mean that would be that's a wonderful niche for somebody to collect or some place to collect because so many of those have been thrown yeah. out. Uh, yeah. theaters had sometimes had them, early movie theaters and things like that. So who there's knows a huge person in attics. <laughs> Huge collection in Vermont of those. And um, we used to, so I got married in Virgins, Vermont and at this at the city hall, town hall. Well, it's a city, smallest city in the country or something. Um, but the, there's a painted curtain on that stage and it made for a stunning backdrop for, for a wedding um, and photos. But it, there's a number of them across Vermont. And when I worked at the Vermont Humanities Council years ago, we provided some grant money to getting a lot of those restored because they're they're incredible mm -hmm. and they are you know just these local local artists and so forth that that made them um or and massively or huge yeah it's john um so the um the grange in topson was on the hidden history tour back in 19, uh, 19 right. uh, 2019 I actually right. have some photos of those. Yeah, I can send to you if you want to share them with Linda. I'd love uh, to yeah. see them. Yeah, I that's where. Yeah, quite. Yeah. They are beautiful. So I can. I think we do have some photos, so I can certainly send those. Send those to her. 
you know, those are the objects that you learn so much from. And, and nowadays, you know, what, what we would call sometimes popular culture, you know, just things that are, you know, not made for museums or, you know, elite patrons, but are just out there to be, you know, part of the culture. And boy, you can learn so much from those things in terms of image transmission, in terms of, you know, what life was like in a local place or, um, it, I, I appreciate learning about them. I'd love to see the pictures. That'd be great. Great. The one at the Topsom Grange, what impressed me, because I went on that history tour too, was yeah. um, all the ads for local businesses. Uh -huh. So yeah. we're looking back at history, but also some of them or their you know, the descendants, if you will, <laughs> of these right. businesses are still in the Topsom Brunswick area. It was, it was fascinating. That's that's great. I, well, so is it just hanging there? I mean, is it being preserved in any way, or um, it's, it's no just... preservation? But yeah. and if I remember correctly, there was more than one panel. Um, oh. Only one was decorated, but they had some others that came down yeah. around it, yeah. Uh, yeah. and they could roll it up to get it out of the way. And, and do you know what it's on? Is it on like a fabric or a canvas or? Yeah, do you know it's, it's... Seem like fabric to me. I don't know what anyone else yeah. thought. You know, like a burlapy type. Yeah, stuff. heavy fabric. Yeah, yeah. You'll have to go check it out, Linda. Right. <laughs> well, can I just wander in there and look at it? No. Uh, no, they they're not open all the time. Yeah. Yeah. But if oh, they no. were open, I'm sure they'd let you go look at it. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe I can get, I can get you a contact. I'll I'll wait for the I'll wait for the pictures. I I think that's good. <laughs> Oh, wow. So thank you so much, Linda. Oh, that was great. What a great way to kick off. And great way to kick off. I learned something. So that's great. Right here. I'm sure that everybody learned something. Oh, I, I, learned, I learned a lot you know. too. That's a good and way to and this program will have a life beyond since we recorded <laughs> it. So Thanks thank you much. very much to everyone. And I will send out the list of all the artwork that you saw. Um, and we are really grateful for your participation. Okay, well, good. I hope you go to some of the programs. I'm going to, you know, get out of my study and get out into the real world now. It's, I mean, <laughs> your schedule looks amazing. And Thank you. Good. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you so much. Great to see you.